Good day, brothers and sisters, wherever you are. And uh, it is uh, another blessed moment that uh, we thank our Heavenly Father for the opportunity to be able to share in his word. Uh, I welcome you to the number three in the series, The Tabernacles. And uh, uh, this uh, very hour, I'll be looking at the issue of uh, the veil. I'll be looking at the issue of the veil. And so uh, I really want to thank God the way he has been uh, guiding and leading us. And uh, we know that uh, he will continue uh, uh, giving us the truth for this time that will help us to be able to stand um, at uh, the perilous days that we are living in. And so i like us to be able to pray and then we can be able to enter into the session fully the veil. And so shall we uh, bow for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thanksgiving and adoration. I just uh, bless your name for giving me the breath of life, Lord. Who am I but uh, clay that you can use for your holy service? And I pray that you may consecrate me and uh, you may sanctify me that the words that I speak may be words of life, words that uh, will bring uh, a difference in my life and the life of those who will be able to view this message and listen to it. Your name be glorified in everything. Lay the glory of man in dust that Christ alone may be uplifted up. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. And so uh, if uh, there is something that uh, the Lord has impressed uh, some uh, information on us is uh, the issue concerning the sanctuary and how I pray that uh, we shall continue learning in the school of Christ. And so as we go through the series of the tabernacles, we are on the uh, third uh, uh, presentation, which is the veil. And how important was this veil? How important was this veil is something that uh, we are going to seek to answer in this series. Now, we find that um, all the vessels of the sanctuary and the services pointed to Jesus Christ, who is the Lamb of God, who is the prophet, who is the priest and the high priest, and who is the king to come in glory. And so every vessel of the sanctuary touches his life. And uh, let us look at the veil. How does it involve Jesus Christ? In the book of uh, Hebrews, in the book of Hebrews chapter, chapter 10, in the book of Hebrews uh, chapter 10, This is what we read in Hebrews chapter 10, verses um, 20. And uh, it says, By a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh. And so the veil of the sanctuary represented the flesh of Jesus Christ. Now, this is a very vital point in the sanctuary because uh, how is the flesh of Jesus Christ so important unto us as uh, a people and how does it concern us as um, a people who are being saved as in the plan of redemption? What part does it have to do? Um, we are told that that veil represents his flesh. And uh, when you go to the book of uh, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, sorry, the book of uh, Second Corinthians, chapter five. The book of uh, First Corinthians, chapter five, and uh, it is verses. Um, it is uh, verse um, twenty-one. For he hath made him to be seen for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So the person who knew no sin was made sin, and for what reason that we might be made the righteousness of God. And so when we talk about the veil, which represents the, uh, the, the, the flesh of Jesus Christ, we are talking about sin being put on him 
it is an exchange of a sinful life with a sinless life. This by the means we get um, our righteousness. And uh, you remember that uh, when the sacrifices were offered, the blood was taken and sprinkled on the veil. And then the flesh of the sacrifice was burned at the altar of burnt offering. And so we find that that which contains sin was slain or was burned at the altar of sacrifice so that the blood which did not have sin may be sprinkled on the veil of the sanctuary. And so it was an exchange of uh, a sinful life with a sinless life. And so we find that uh, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christ, who was um, uh, 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 sinless, died on Calvary that he may give us a life that is righteous. When he died on Calvary, like the lamb in the sanctuary, sin was upon him. So the body that had sin was burned at the altar of uh, burnt offering, not for its own sin, but for the sin of uh, the sinner who had came into the sanctuary to confess his sins. And then the blood, which is life, were carried to the veil. And so we have Jesus Christ entering into the heavens, not with the bloods of goats and lambs, but with his own blood, which is a sinless blood, which is life indeed that has righteousness to give unto us. And so he exchanged his life for our life. And then we who are being saved now, our life is hid in Christ. Our life is hid in Christ. And uh, now the righteousness of Jesus Christ is counted on us. And so this veil carrying our sin, this is the body of Jesus Christ, was burned or was punished or was offered as a sacrifice so that we may not suffer the penalty of sin because we were disobedient, but now we have been forgiven. In the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, and uh, I'll be giving you a verse in a while. The book of Leviticus, chapter 25, and uh, uh, follow with me of verse, um, verse 47, verse 47. We are talking about the veil and Hebrews 10 verse, um, uh, Hebrews 10 verse 20, we have found that uh, the veil represents the body of Jesus Christ and the body of Jesus Christ was punished or was uh, offered at Calvary. And then his life was offered in heaven he went into heaven, not with the blood of gods and lambs, but with his own precious blood, which is life. And so the life that was sinless is the one which is accounted on us. That, um, that veil signified his flesh, which is a means to our righteousness. We are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 uh, that, um, uh, that um, uh, he who was sinless was made sin and for what? for our righteousness. Now, in the book of Leviticus, chapter 25, verse um, 47, and if a sojourner, 47, Leviticus 25, verse 47, and if a sojourner or a stranger works rich by thee, and thy brother that dwelleth by him works poor, and sell himself unto the stranger or sojourner by thee, or to the stock of the stranger's family, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again, one of his brethren may redeem him, either his uncle or his uncle's son may redeem him, or any that is nigh of kin unto him of his family may redeem him, or if he is able, he may redeem himself. And he shall reckon with him that brought him from the year that he was sold to him unto the year of Jubilee, and the price of his sale shall be according unto the numbers of years, according to the time of an hired servant shall it be with him. If there be yet many years behind, according unto them, he shall give again the price of his redemption out of the money that he was bought for. And if there remain but few years unto the year of Jubilee, then he shall come with him 
and according unto his years shall he give him again the price of redemption. And as a yearly hired servant shall he be with him, and the other shall not rule with rigor over him in that sight. And if he be not redeemed in these years, then he shall go out in the year of Jubilee, both he and his children with him. For unto me the children of Israel are servants, they are my servants that whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt. I am the Lord, you are God. And so let us try to unpack this. If a sojourner, verse 47, Leviticus 25, verse 47, if a sojourner or a stranger works rich by thee and thy brother that dwelleth by him works poor, we find that um, Satan came as a stranger on this earth because the earth was created for Adam and his posterity. But then there was an intruder, this stranger Satan, and he waxed rich against the brother that was on the earth. That is Eve's, uh, Adam's wife, which is Eve. And then she sold herself unto the devil by sinning. And then Adam did not have the price to buy out Eve. And so we are told only a kinsman redeemer, the person of the same family can be able to redeem this person. And so because Eve had sinned and Adam followed him into sin and he didn't have the price to pay for the law that was broken, the divine law. Since the law was divine, it needed a divine being to pay the price. And so Adam could not pay the price he being the brother to Eve. And also he had plunged himself in sin by eating the fruit that Eve brought unto him. And so the two of them were in sin. They waxed poor and the stranger, which is Satan, waxed rich. And so there needed to be someone who did not only possess humanity, but divinity to be able to redeem Adam and Eve. And I'll tell you why divinity was so much important so that Adam may be, uh, the, the, the family may be, uh, 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 the earth may be redeemed, as we shall be continuing with this, that um, actually the atoning sacrifice does not only cover humanity, but it covers also angels. We shall see this. And the law that was broken being divine, it needed somebody who's divine to be able to pay the price. That is why humanity could not pay it and angels could not pay it because they were a yoke of obedience unto the Father and the Son. And so it needed more than a human, it needed more than a creature to be able to pay the sacrifice. But not only that, we are told that uh, after that he is sold, he may be redeemed again, one of his brethren may redeem him. Now, Christ could not come here as a fully divine being to be able to redeem Adam and Eve. And the reason is this, this could have broken the cycle of uh, Genesis chapter one, where we are told that um, every uh, thing had to reproduce of its own kind. Now, two that were of different natures could not bring of the same kind. And so in order for Christ to redeem humanity, he must have humanity to be able to interact with humanity because he had to be of the same kind. A brother and uncle of the same family had to redeem the one who had sold himself. So Jesus Christ had to come with the flesh of humanity. We are talking about the veil and the veil represents the flesh of Jesus Christ according to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20. Now, I just uh, rereading Hebrews chapter 10, verse 20, we are told by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say his flesh. And so the flesh of Jesus Christ must be of the same kind of humanity because only of the same kind could be able to interact and to reproduce. And so Christ could not come here full divine, missing humanity and interact with human beings. He will not be of the same kind or an uncle or a brother or of the kinsman redeemer. 
And so he was made, uh, the word was made flesh and then he could interact. Now, at that point, having humanity, the only thing he could offer to human beings is his humanity, his flesh, and be an example to them that they can overcome sin in this same flesh that is fallen, that is sinful. But again now, humanity did not only need humanity to be saved. It needed divinity or divine being because the law was divine and the nature of sin was supernatural, so it needed someone supernatural. And then, so Christ as a human will interact with humanity and Christ as a divine son of God could interact with the God of heaven. So he was the link between humanity and divinity. He had to have these two natures so as to be able to interact with humanity and able to be interact with the divinity. And so in the same person, we had the two distinct natures, the divine nature and the human nature. And um, now we are able as human beings being shown a pattern by our kinsman redeemer of our own flesh that sin can be overcome. There is no excuse because he came with humanity, never used his divinity, but went all through the way a sinless person. And so he redeemed us and then he brought us inside. Through the consecration of the veil, we pass through the veil into the most holy place. You remember the veil separated the holy place and the most holy place. And it is through the veil that we get into the most holy place. Meaning, the veil being the flesh of Jesus Christ, there is no other person that can get us an access to the Father. It is that veil. It is that Jesus Christ. And we cannot get to the Father in a sinful state. Isaiah chapter 58, 59, it tells us it is because of our iniquity that we have been separated from our father. But now through the veil, through Jesus Christ, through his flesh, we can now interact with the father. For when we pass through the veil, we receive atonement for blood was sprinkled on the veil and then the sinful person was atoned for and now he could have access to the Father. Now, during the day of atonement, let us go to the book of Daniel chapter 9, chapter 8, sorry, the book of Daniel chapter 8, and I'd like you to see something. These are things that we have to learn and understand what is happening in the day of atonement and through this veil what is happening. In Daniel chapter 8 verse 14, we are told, and to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And to 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. And per se, what was the sanctuary that was being cleansed? We find that during the day of atonement, this veil was cleansed. Now, Jesus Christ does not have sin, but we have sin. And so in the cleansing of that veil, in the atoning of that veil, the blood being sprinkled on the veil, it meant that it is human beings which were being cleansed their soul temple from iniquity. And then they can be able to enter into the presence of the Father. So unto 2,300 days, then the sanctuary shall be cleansed. It means that we have to transfer our sins unto Jesus Christ, who is the veil. Then he can give us our own righteous, his own righteousness. Then we can be able to interact with our father who is a sinless being. And so Daniel chapter seven in verses, verses uh, nine going onward. Daniel chapter seven verses nine going onward. And this is in the timeline or the time setting of uh, the sanctuary being cleansed. I beheld till the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit, whose garments was white as snow and the hair of his head like the pure wool. I'm reading from Daniel chapter seven from verse nine going downwards. And the hair of his head like, like uh, and the hair of his head like the pure wool, his throne was like the fiery flame and his wheels as burning 
fire. And a fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousands, thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousands times ten thousands stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. I beheld then, because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake, I beheld even till the beast was slain, and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. Verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their life were prolonged for a season and time. And this is something that we have to speak about. Concerning the rest of the beasts, the first three beasts of, of Daniel chapter 7, their, dom their um, dominion was taken away. Their empire was taken away. But their life was prolonged in the fourth beast. Now, the first beast of Daniel chapter 7 is Babylon. The second beast, beast is Medopatia. And the third beast, beast is Greece. The fourth beast is the Roman Empire, both in its two faces, the pagan Rome and the papal Rome. Now, the dominion of the first three were taken away by their life, but their life was prolonged in the fourth beast. This is something which is so much important because it relates with atonement. When you read Revelation chapter 13, we find that the beast rising from the sea, which is the Roman uh, Empire, it has um, um, the mouth of a lion, it has the feet of a bear, and the body is like the body of the leopard. It is a nondescript beast. It is a composed beast. That is why in Daniel chapter 7, Daniel could not describe it. But I'm interested in the life of these three beasts being prolonged in the fourth beast. Babylon had their life or their attributes. By the way, life is character. Life is the attribute, the quality of life. In Babylon, they worshipped false gods. And this is the life they passed unto the fourth beast, the worship of false gods. In medo Persia, they had what we call infallibility. Their decrees once written down, they could not be changed. So their life was passed unto the fourth beast. And the papal Rome actually claims infallibility. It speaks ex cathedra. The Grecian Empire, it was known of it is education and revelry and licentiousness. This kind of life, which is higher criticism or humanism, and false education, that is philosophy, was passed into the fourth beast also. And we are living in a time where false education really uh, has been rampant. When you read the Great Controversy, it says that uh, when the Jesuits came into, uh, 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 into being, they established schools for the noble and public schools for the ordinary people. And when you read, uh, Rulers of Evil by Efta Pasosi. He says that uh, the kind of system of education they introduced was learning against learning. You think that your child is in school learning anything, but actually it's learning against learning. When they come out of those public schools, when they come out of this system of education, they have been taught evolution. They have been taught um, what else? Uh, they have been taught false Sabbath. They have been taught purgatory. They have been taught penance. They have been taught all these things. And that is why you find in Daniel 8 that uh, this fourth beast possessing the life of the other three beasts trembled upon the sanctuary and truth was cast down. The truth about Jesus Christ, who is the veil, who is the only mediator and a channel unto the Father. That truth was cast down. And that is why you find the people are still in their sins because they have lost uh, 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 sight of the veil that is Jesus Christ to get his education, to get his life, and to get his righteousness. They have substituted the veil and the sanctuary itself with the uh, 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 the life of this fourth beast, which has inherited the characteristics of the other three beasts. How does this bring in the issue of the cleansing of the sanctuary and the veil and Jesus Christ? This 
three beasts, they continue their life in the fourth beast, but we have another beast, the lamb, Jesus Christ, John 1, 29, who taketh away the sins of the world. When he died and resurrected and went to heaven, his life was also continued in his church because that is what he offered himself for, to give his life. So while these three beasts in Daniel chapter 7, they continue their life in the fourth beast, which has another setup of the sanctuary and another means of salvation, the lamb, the stone, which is Jesus Christ, when he has resurrected and goes to his father, his dominion is not actually taken away. Although he is not physical on earth and is in heaven, his life is continued in his church. When you continue reading the book of Daniel, why the judgment was set, it is because of the great words of this beast, because he had cast down the sanctuary truth. And now it has to be restored by looking unto Jesus Christ, the author and finisher of our faith. And we are told, in the, I saw in the night visions, after seeing this beast continuing the life of the other three beasts, we are told in verse 13, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. For what reason? And there was given him what? Dominion. Remember the book of um, Matthew chapter 28, verse 18, all power and authority has been given unto me going into the world. So this lamb, while the fourth beast is giving his subject the, his life, the lamb also is giving his subject his life. And so there are two lives running concurrent on this day of atonement. The life of the lamb, the veil, which is Jesus Christ, and the life of the fourth beast, which is the Roman hierarchy. Verse 14 of Daniel chapter 7, and there was given him dominion and glory and kingdom that all people, nations, and language should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that, that which shall not be destroyed. And so even as the life of Jesus Christ could not be destroyed, he resurrected from the dead because he was sinless. So his subjects who accept him as the veil, as the atoning sacrifice, their dominion and their kingdom is everlasting. It cannot be taken away. The setup is in the day of atonement where our sins are transferred to the veil and that is Jesus Christ and he gives us his own sinless life. While the fourth beast is passing all the attributes that cannot give victory over sin, the lamb, Jesus Christ, is giving the attributes that are able to give us victory over sin. And then we go, Daniel chapter 7, verses, verses um, 26. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion, the dominion of the fourth beast, which possess the life of the other three beasts. The dominion, that is his empire, his attributes, and everything that concerns him, the fourth beast in Daniel chapter 7. It shall be taken away. They shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And when his dominion is being taken away in his life, Verse 27, and the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven shall be given to the people of the saints of the most high, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominion shall serve and obey him. So on the day of atonement, when judgment sits, the main purpose of Jesus Christ, who is our veil, is to take away the dominion of the little horn, his characteristics, his empire that he has usurped, and then give the dominion and the everlasting kingdom to the subject of his kingdom, who are accepting him as the only mediator between man and God. Now, how is the dominion of the little horn or the fourth beast taken away and the life of Christ given to the saints? The first prophecy in the Bible, Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, says that 
there shall be enmity between the seed of the serpent and the seed of the woman. The seed of the woman shall bruise the head of the serpent and the seed of the serpent shall bruise the heel of the seed of the woman. Now in Galatians chapter three, verse 16, we are told that the seed of the woman is Jesus Christ. And one John, first John chapter three, verse nine says that whoever is born of God does not continue to commit sin because the seed of he who has born him remains in him. So in the day of atonement, in this setup, the only way to take away the dominion of the little horn or the fourth beast of Daniel chapter seven is by taking the sins of the saints, giving them to Jesus Christ. And because he is the high priest, we are told his work is to lay upon the seed of the serpent the sins of the people because he is the originator of that. And so we are told that um, whatever Satan have thought of God, Psalms chapter 7 verse 16, it shall return upon his head. So it is us giving the high priest the sin, and when the high priest comes from the most holy place, his work is to lay the sins on the head of the scapegoat, or this fourth beast, or this little horn, which is are actually a shadow government of Satan himself. Going to the book of Hebrews chapter, uh, Daniel chapter 8 verse 14 says that uh, the sanctuary shall be cleansed, which means that um, it shall be justified. It shall be restored unto its original stature. And um, the sanctuary being cleansed is the cleansing of the soul temple from every defilement. In the giving of the prophecy of Daniel chapter 8, verse 14, a part of it was cut off and given to the Jewish people. Wherein we find in Daniel chapter 9, this prophecy that was cut off from 2300 days, they, it was given to the Jewish people and they had to accomplish something. Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, it says, 70 weeks are cut off upon thy people or determined. They are cut off from the 2300 days and given to the Jewish. What do they have to accomplish in this? They have to finish the transgression, Daniel 9, 24, and to make an end of sins and to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. The sad thing is that uh, when this time period was finished, instead of these six pointers being achieved by the Jewish people, they instead crucified Jesus Christ. And now we are the spiritual Jewish, and we have to meet the six pointers in Daniel chapter 9, verse 24, in the cleansing of the sanctuary. And so we have to make an end of sin, to make reconciliation for iniquity and to bring in everlasting righteousness and to seal up the vision of prophecy and to anoint the most holy place. We have to receive the righteousness of Jesus Christ that we may stop sinning and repenting, sinning and repenting. When Christ comes out of the most holy place, it is only those who have been benefited with his mediation that are going to be saved. And so he is our veil. He is our propitiation. He is our kinsman redeemer. His flesh was offered for our iniquity. In this same day of atonement, as we look at the veil, turn with me in the book of uh, Hebrews chapter 8. The book of Hebrews chapter 8. We are told this in Hebrews chapter 8, that uh, verse 6, going to verse 10. But now hath he obtained a more excellent ministry, that is Jesus Christ, by how much also he is the mediator of the better covenant, which was established upon the better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then should no place have been sought for the second. For finding fault with them, he said, Behold, the days come, said the Lord, when I'll make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Now, 
He had made an old covenant with the house of Israel, but he will make a new covenant with the house of Judah. When you read Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13, in fact, we are told in verse 9, before we go to Deuteronomy 4, 13, the new covenant, verse 9, Hebrews 8, 9, not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, because they continued not in my covenant, and I regarded them not, said the Lord. So what was this old covenant? Hebrews, uh, Deuteronomy chapter 4, verse 13. What was this old covenant? Deuteronomy 4, 13, we are told. And he declared unto you his covenant, which he commanded you to perform even 10 commandments, and he wrote them upon the two tables of stone. So the old covenant had the 10 commandments, but where were they written? They were written on the table of stones. Now he's saying that I'll make a new covenant with them. So how is the new covenant different from the old covenant? He says in verse 10, Hebrews chapter 8, verse 10, the new covenant. For this is the covenant that I'll make with the house of Israel after those days, said the Lord. I will put my laws into their mind and write them in their hearts, and I'll be to them a God, and they shall be to me a people. The old covenant, 10 commandments written on the table of stones. The new con covenant, the 10 commandments written in the table of um, our hearts, written on, the, on our hearts and on our minds so that we may serve the living God. That is the difference. And uh, why does he write the Ten Commandments or his law on our hearts? Because in the most holy place, there is the Ark of Covenant. And in the Ark of Covenant, we have the Ten Commandments. Now, we cannot interact with the Ten Commandments in a sinful state and be able to live. It will only require death. But if they are written in our hearts, that means that we have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ, and then we can interact with the Ten Commandments, and it will not slay us because now we are not under the condemnation of the Ten Commandments, but we are under the grace, that is the power of Jesus Christ to be obedient to the Ten Commandments. In fact, we are told in Romans chapter 8, the book of Romans chapter Eight, this is what we are told. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus. That is the veil, his body. Who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. And we are told in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 17. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. All things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. So when we accept this veil, when we accept this flesh, when we accept this Jesus Christ as the veil, the old things passes away and the new things come. The law or the new covenant is written on our hearts. And then we can serve the living God. I'd like to bring to you your attention one thing also in Hebrews. Chapter 9, we are looking at the veil. That is Jesus Christ himself. The blood was sprinkled on the veil. The life of Jesus Christ was given unto us. And so Hebrews chapter 9. Look at the book of Hebrews chapter 9. Verses 8. And to verses 10. And then we shall see this. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 8 says, The Holy Ghost signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest. There was that veil that received the blood of gods and lambs, and so the way had not been revealed fully. And that veil represented Jesus Christ. When he came, then the truth was revealed fully. So the Holy Ghost, this the Holy Ghost is signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest, while as the first tabernacle was yet standing, because all it had was a type, but not the real substance. Verse 9, 
which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience. So the typical, the typical service could not make him that did the service perfect according to the conscience or conscience. They only stood or they stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washing and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of reformation. That is when the time when the type meets the anti-type. So verse 11, but Christ being come on a high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own, blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained eternal redemption for us so now the typical service could not make the commas there imperfect according to the conscience but jesus christ with his own blood we are told in verse 14 hebrews chapter 9 how much more shall the blood of christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So the blood of Jesus Christ speaks better than the blood of gods and lambs. Hebrews chapter 10, verse one. For the law, having a shadow of good things to come and not the very image of the things, can never with those sacrifices, which they offered year by year, continually make the comers there unto perfect. So if they could make anyone perfect, then the sacrifices could not be continued yearly. But Christ has now offered the sacrifice once and for all, and the services will never continue forever, but will come to an end. In which way, for then would they not have ceased to be offered because that the worshippers once purged should have no more conscience of sin. If these typical sacrifices could take away sin, then the services could have come to an end. But it's only the service of Jesus Christ, the anti-typical service, that will bring all this sin problem to an end because he gives us his own life. The goats, the bullocks, the lambs had not lived the life of humanity and gain an experience to give to humanity so that they may overcome sin. But Jesus Christ being the Lamb of God with his own life, lived in humanity, overcame sin, and now his blood, his life can be offered to us and give us an experience to overcome sin and bring an end to the sanctuary services. And so we are told in chapter 10 and look from verse 12. But this man, Jesus Christ, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. From henceforth, expecting till his enemies be put, uh, be made his footstool. For by one offering, he hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Whereof? The Holy Ghost also is a witness to us, for after that he had said before, this is the covenant that I'll make with them after those days, said the Lord. I'll put my laws into their hearts and in their minds will I write them, and their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. So when we accept the veil, Jesus Christ, the atoning sacrifice, our sins are not remembered anymore. In which way? because they are taken away, they are washed and purged. And so, verse 18 of Hebrews chapter 10, now where remission of this is, there is no more offering of sin. If sins have been taken away, they have been purged and washed, and we have received the righteousness of Jesus Christ, there is no more sacrifices. There is no more uh, uh, offering of, for sin. But now Jesus Christ comes from the holy place and takes his own people. In the book of Jeremiah, as uh, we bring this to an end, the book of Jeremiah, you can see the importance of that veil, the importance of the life of Jesus Christ. The book of uh, Jeremiah, and uh, 
uh, chapter 50, verses 20. Jeremiah, look at this new covenant as uh, we accept the veil in our life, as we accept, accept the blood to be sprinkled and his righteousness to be given unto us. Jeremiah 50, verse 20 says, in those days and in that time, when the new covenant is being made with God and his people, when atonement is going on, when the judgment is sitting, and the life of the fourth beast and the little horn is being taken away, and the life of the lamb is being given to the people, he says, the iniquity of Israel shall be sought for, and there shall be none, and the sins of Judah, and they shall not be found, for I will pardon them whom I reserve. The word reserved there is remnant. So the remnant shall not have any sins in them because Christ will have cleansed them from all sin. Malachi chapter 3. The book of Malachi chapter 3. Very important thing. Probation has been given to us, friends, so that Christ may not come to save us in sin, but he may save us from sin. Now, if we say that um, we have entered into the most holy place through the veil, and then we are sinning and repenting, then we don't realize what it means to pass through the veil. John chapter 14, before we read Malachi chapter 3, John chapter 14, verse 6, we are told that I'm the way, the, I'm the truth, the way, and life. I'm the way, truth, and life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Now, what does Jesus Christ mean that no one comes to the Father but by me? It means that you cannot behold the Father if you have not received Jesus Christ. And to receive Jesus Christ is to receive the righteousness of the Father ultimately. So, Malachi chapter 3, we shall be going into the second part of uh, the veil in the fourth presentation because I cannot can enter into the second part right now. I'll share some verses and quotes which actually will resonate with us that time. That veil, that sacrifice covers the unfallen ones, it covers the angels, and it covers the whole universe. It is not just for me and for you that Jesus Christ died. He died for angels, he died for the inhabitants of unfallen ones, and he died for the whole universe. And when I say the whole universe, it is um, the planet itself, including the plants and uh, inanimate and uh, inanimate things. For we are told that the whole creation groans as it waits for the manifestation of the sons of God, which means that even the animals are covered there, the plants are covered there, and everything that has breath or has life in it, it is covered in the sacrifice. We are told even the loaf we eat, it is stamped by the blood of Jesus Christ. If it were not for this veil, then nothing will be continuing to exist as we speak right now. So the animals, the plants, the angels, the inhabitants of the unfallen world, they are covered in this sacrifice. I'll enter into it in the fourth presentation, uh, God willing, tomorrow if we are spared, spared life. So let me read the last thing in Malachi chapter 3. He says, Behold, I'll send my messenger, and he shall prepare the way before me, and the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple. This coming suddenly in the temple was not coming into the earth, but entering into the most holy place to start uh, the mediation on the day of atonement. How do we know this? Or how do I know this? He says, even the message of the covenant, and you know he cannot come before the covenant is made. So this coming is not coming on the earth. It is the coming in the most holy place to make a covenant, even the new covenant with his people so that the subjects of uh, his kingdom may be made up. So the coming is in the most holy place. To make the covenant, this is the messenger whom you delight in. Behold, he shall come, said the Lord of hosts. Look at when he comes into the most holy place to make the covenant, what happens there? Verse 2, but who, shall, but who may abide the day of his coming, and who shall stand when he appeareth? 
for he is like a refiner's fire and like a fuller soap. Now you know that uh, the refining fire is it is not the time of destroying anything, but the time of refining it so that it may be a complete item that is perfect and can be presented before someone. So, and the soap is used for washing and making everything clean. So this coming in the temple is not the coming to destroy sinners, but the coming to, re, uh, to reconcile them to the Father. And so verse 3 says, and he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier. And that is how we understand the coming in the temple is the coming in the most holy place. Because he sits, he doesn't stand. When he is sitting, he is doing the work of redemption. When he stands, it is to protect his people against the seven last plagues. So he shall sit as a refiner and a purifier of silver, and he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering of righteousness. And we saw that the veil takes away our sins. Second Corinthians 5.21, and it gives us his righteousness. And so that they may offer an offering in righteousness, then shall the offering of Judah and Jerusalem be pleasant unto the Lord as in the days of old and as in former years. And then, verse 5, and I'll come near to you to judgment, and I'll be swift witness against the sorcerers and against the adulterers and against the false swearers and against those that op oppress the hireling in his wages, the widow and the fatherless, and that turn aside the stranger from his right, and fear not me, said the Lord, for I am the Lord. I change not therefore ye sons of Jacob are not consumed. And so, brothers and sisters, this is the issue. Sin has to be overcome before Christ comes to execute judgment. When he is still seated as the veil between the holy place and the most holy place, as the only mediator between man and God, then we can receive his righteousness by giving him our sins. Time has been allotted unto us so that we may remedy every defect in our character and be fitted for the heavens above. My prayer is this, and I'll read a verse which is my prayer, Philippians chapter 3. This is the closing and the parting short. Philippians chapter 3, verses uh, 9. This is my prayer, and it should be your prayer too. While Christ is seated doing the work of atonement and taking away the dominion of the fourth, of the fourth beast, which has in itself Babylon, it has in itself Medo-Persia, and it has in itself Greece. As this is being taken away, let us accept the life and the dominion of the Lamb, John 1, 29, which taketh away the sins of the world, and enter into the most holy place, in, in which way, Philippians 3, 9, and be found in him, not having my own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. So as we put our sins on the veil and the veil gives us his life, the ultimate righteousness, according to Philippians 3.9, is the righteousness of the Father. The law is a transcript of the character of the Father. And so for us to be accepted of the Father, then the divine law that was, to be, was broken has to be written in our minds so that as man was created in the likeness and in the image of God, after the redemption plan, we may be in the likeness and in the image of God our God, not having our own righteousness, but having the righteousness of God. But how do we get it? Through the veil, which is Jesus Christ. May the Lord bless us. May we contemplate upon these things. This should not be just information. This should be a means of getting the spirit of Christ to work in us. 
Christ says that the words that I speak unto you, they are spirit and life. And so as we hear these words of the sanctuary, may we not just receive information, but as we receive these words, may we be receiving even the Holy Spirit of God, which is life. And may the Lord bless us. Shall we just uh, close with uh, a word of prayer? Abba Father, glory and honor be unto thee. Lord, it's not in the eloquence of language, but uh, a submission of our heart, Conrad heart, that uh, you accept humanity. And so, Father, amidst all this information we have, may we have this saving information that Jesus Christ has given his life so that we may get immortality. And now our life is hid in him. Thank you. You gave us eternal life, and that eternal life is in your son. And so help us to receive your son that we may receive the same life. Honor and glory be unto thee. Be with your children as they contemplate upon these things. Lord, may you convict us and may you convert us and seal our hearts above in the courts in heaven. This is my prayer. And these things I ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.